visiting the Lake Arrowhead rink with some of my skaters several years ago. And I noticed that there was all this high intensity training going on and all um, great, you know, great technical information was being imparted on these kids and everything looked good. I mean, these are elite athletes, except that people were miserable. The kids were miserable. <laughs> so I was like, we gotta do something about this. I mean, they can't choose to be here every day and still be miserable. Something's not right. So I felt like there was this gaping wound in the mental training aspect in that particular um, environment. And that's not to say the coaching wasn't excellent. The coaching was excellent. It's not to say that the parents were good. I have no idea. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> although I will tell you, just the, as a side note, um, has anybody ever trained at Lake Arrowhead? Has anyone ever been to that room? Okay. So it was this beautiful facility with no boards. So you're like, oh, you can just step on at any point, which means you can also fall off. <laughs> it's a little risky. Um, but there were there were ficus trees, they're like you know, bench tree, bench tree, bench tree, and um, there was a particularly um, hovery mom, and she would hide behind the trees, oh, thinking oh, her kid okay. couldn't see her. So so she like this, and then the tree would move, and then the tree would move. And anyway, so at one point, the girl was in a lesson with me, and she's like, I know that tree's moving because my mom was behind it, <laughs> first of all. But anyway, so there might have been some weird parent drama going on. But I just, just think, maybe. maybe. Um, but I also, speaking of that, I think I just want to say that we all contribute to our training environments. Coaches, athletes, parents, we all contribute. So as adult skaters or as coaches, just be mindful of the fact that when you walk in the building, your energy can affect everybody in that building, positive or negative. And I really feel like that's an important message because everybody has bad days. Coaches have bad days, skaters have bad days, parents have lots of bad days. <laughs> um, and really it's up to us to make that conscientious choice to walk in and not make it a bad day. That being said, how many people are involved in the skating world by choice? There's not one person in this room that's forced to be there, right? Okay, so when you walk in the door, regardless of your role, remember that that is your choice. Um, I had a really, I don't know if you call her wise, she was a really neat boss, um, one of my first skating director bosses. and. It was before I decided that skating um, coaching was going to be a career for me. It was when I was still like had a foot in both worlds, in the science world and in the coaching world. And I walked in the building one day, and I was just exhausted because I was working overnight at a hospital, uh, dancing and emceeing at bar mitzvahs. That's a side note. And then <laughs> teaching my skating. So I know, right? So um, I walked in the door and I was just like, I think I looked like I was just dragging my own ass around. I mean, that's literally what I think I looked like. She's like, How are you? And I said. Oh, I'm tired. You know, I just started like kind of whinging. That's the Australian word I, I learned for not being right. Um, and she's like, you know, you're here by choice. So if you want to wake up tomorrow and change your whole paradigm, change it. Do something different. Don't come here and complain about what you've done or what you're going to do or what you're doing. Just be here, be present, and and make the the effort to enjoy every moment of what you're doing. So I pass that message on um, to everybody I ever talk to because I think it's such a key thing is that particularly with skating, this is a choice whether you're a skater or a coach. Many, many coaches have skill sets that reach far beyond teaching ice skating. So if you don't love what you're doing and you can't do it well and you don't make people happy, just go do something else. That being said, you're getting a piece of paper or a notepad and a pen. Thank you so much, you guys, for hanging this out. Um, I should have decided that this is what we were going to do before right now, but usually when things come to me on the fly, they end up being really awesome. So we're going to do this small activity uh, that we did last week with my other campers, and it turned out amazing. So we're going to see if we can beat them. We're going to top them. So the topic that we're really supposed to be talking about has nothing to do with positive energy. Well, it kind of does. But it really has to do with maximizing your time, maximizing your um, potential, and really using your skill set to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve, whether that's a tangible goal, like a number, a score, whether that's just I want to get out there and really feel great when I'm done, whether that's 
I just want to be healthy enough through my next season to, to finish my season. Whatever your goal is, we all have shared experiences in this sport. And so this, um, I call this rolling poetry. You'll find out why later that it's rolling. But for a coach, for me as a coach, the scariest moment is, was not at the Olympics. It's not at a you know, big international competition. I have never panicked at nationals. The scariest moment for me as a coach is the very first competition of the season with any of my athletes. Because at that moment, I am the most accountable, right? So the first competition of the season is more of a reflection of me than it is of my skater. Did I read the rules? Do I have the spins right? Am I sure that I'm following all of the new rule changes? Do I, you know, is this short program compliant with this season? Whatever is going on, it's going on in my mind like this crazy checklist. Did I send this person out there with the right tools to reach their potential? And so that being said, the door closes and they go away and I'm standing there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so vulnerable because when we go to the critique, these people could say to me, how dare you put a flying sit in when you know it's a flying camel this season, right? And that's me as the coach. As the season goes on, obviously, it becomes more the skater because now I know we've got the rules in place. Now I know we've got the right elements. I'm sure of that. We've been doing it all season. And it becomes more the skater's responsibility. So I'm asking you at that moment when you skate away from your um, coach or when you are the coach and your skater leaves you, you're truly by yourself. You're no longer so much a team. Every day in training, you're a team. And then when the door closes and the name is called, you're alone as the coach, they're alone as the skater. So I'd like you to write a poem. It can rhyme or not rhyme, it doesn't matter. But I'd like you to write five, six, ten lines of a poem of what it feels like. How many coaches are in the room? Perfect, so we're in two different groups. So what it feels like as a coach when your skater leaves you, and then if you're a skater, what it feels like when you're standing center ice or wherever your starting position is, what are you feeling? What's going through your mind, through your body, what emotions, what physiological changes? Kind of put that into a poetic form. It's not going to take too long because we've all been there and you've got to know what it feels like. Feel free to take it line by line. You know, talk about your pulse, talk about your palms, talk about your feet, whatever you need to, but make it poetic. And coaches, same thing, but from a coach's perspective. So we'll do two minutes. groups. Let's take about six minutes. Don't be too profound. We're not publishing these. <laughs> The first line of your poem should be, I stand alone. Start with that. Okay, so raise your hand if you're a skater. We're going to leave coaches out of this first one, skaters. Okay, so skaters, we're going to count off by threes. Keep your hands up so we can count off by threes. So let's go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Two, three, one, two. Skater, coach. Coach, fine. Okay, so all the ones, come on up. I don't know, just be a one. You can be a two and a three, it doesn't make a difference. The, the most beautiful, you can be whatever you want to be. We just know that there were no three. fours, okay? If anybody's a four, you're out of here. That's a lot of ones, how did that happen? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Each one of you, is going to say the first line, and then each one of you is going to say the second line, and then each one of you is going to say the third line, like that. The first line we're going to start with is, I stand alone. So each one of you say that, and then read your first line, your first line, your first line. Okay, let's see how this goes. I stand alone. 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 <laughs> Heart pounding. I am so happy. I step away and present. Core, extend, <laughs> breathe out on the wrong edges. <laughs> on the ice in front of judges who are looking to pinpoint every fall, air and ball that I constituently make. Mm -hmm. Deep breath in. I am so excited. I breathe. I got this. <laughs> People are watching me. Let it all go. Breathe out. I am so lucky. Then breathe more. Big deep breaths. <laughs> Make this look like it feels. That second before the music starts takes forever. 
<laughs> Time to shine. Um, wait, gotta get my ring glasses here. <laughs> I am in my starting position. Nerves in check? Yes, I pray hard. <laughs> Roll those shoulders back. Watch me do this. <laughs> the only thing going through my mind is, ah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, that was my last That's okay, so step back and then everyone else just keep going. If you if you are done, just keep going. Okay. Okay, I focus on my first move. Judges, take note. <laughs> I listen to my music to start. I listen for my music to start. One last breath and off I go. I don't uh, even think about breathing. The universe is always with me. I am already breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then it's, I don't think about smiling, I'm already smiling. Oh. Okay, so two is coming up. That was beautiful. Oh yeah, just skaters still. I'm going to try the, I've never done it with coaches, we'll see how it goes. Okay, I stand alone is the first thing. I stand alone. I stand alone. I stand. <laughs> I stand alone. I stand alone. Wind is weak, stomach queasy. <laughs> I can do it. Ready to conquer my camel and land my lutz? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can do this. Just me and the ice. Why am I here? I don't need to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to breathe. Will I crumble beneath my doubts and insecurities? Take a deep breath. The audience and judges blur in the background as they take a final deep breath. Wait, I'm not alone. I can do it. Can I rise or will I crumble? Close your eyes. And I say, I can, I have, I will. I have the music. I'm soft arms, pretty. I shake, I tremble, I need to pee. It's in every Every single time I'm like, down. Look up and be proud. The music starts and the feeling of gliding, air rushing by. And I have my partner, I hope. <laughs> Breathe. Judges, pens are poised, eyes are alert. Take another deep breath. Knees shaking, heart racing. But I don't feel alone because I hear your words in my head and I know you are skating every moment. <laughs> Smile, breathe. I've got this. The music starts. Calm your heart and your mind. Feel the music. Tell my story. I will show you all. Arms up, shoulders down, and smile. I can do it. Warrior goddess, you've got this. No partner. <laughs> How did we end up with two for <laughs> I know. I got it. Come on, Grace, step it up. Come on. Thank you. Somebody. You know, she's much better. All right. I stand alone. I stand alone. I stand alone. I stand alone. The crowd is quiet. Deep breath. Knees stiff, feet cramped. <laughs> relax, relax. <laughs> My legs may shake. Soft knees. Each second before the be before the music begins is stretched into a minute. Why am I doing this? <laughs> Why did I pick this pose? <laughs> Believe. Then it all goes away. Breathe, breathe. Waiting for the music. Allow the tension to flow into the ice. Before I know it, it's over. My heart is pounding. The judges look cold. <laughs> Trust myself to succeed. I've already forgotten what happened. <laughs> bend, bend, remember to bend my knees. I'm scared. <laughs> but I'm proud regardless. The judges are watching. It's time to go. I hope I hear my music. Smile, <laughs> smile. <laughs> oh. All, right. All right, coaches, let's see what she came up with.
Thinking all the things I want her to remember. Does she feel confident? The quiet that hits the air. They call her name, I get the chills. <laughs> <laughs> my slow breathing and her pounding. Hoping she can hear my thoughts. We are ready for today. Proud jittery sparks fill my bones. The music starts, I talk the elements through the program. Celebrating quiet victories and oops. <laughs> I'm hoping she is enjoying herself. I've instilled confidence. My scare enters her world. Here we go. Seeing her at her best and worst, but I need she can do it. She's worked so hard. She loves this. She'll feel good. Big old smile. She makes me so proud. Hey, okay. I just think that exercise is so amazing. Um, did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. Okay. It, it, it was something I came up with. Um, we had the the fortune of using a um, like a multimedia center kind of uh, arts and theater and this. So we had the stage and. Um, I was doing taps one morning and I really hadn't made a plan for my skaters and that's kind of typical of me is that I'll show up and be like, what are we moving for? What are these faces telling me we need to talk about today? And um, I was getting the sense that the skaters that weren't as successful competitively felt like the skaters that were more successful competitively were actually better athletes or were actually smarter people or were actually less nervous. And so I thought, I'm going to actually prove that every single one of you has the exact same experience. And that was my thought when I was driving to my TAPS program in the morning, and then I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. But I came across a poem that um, the gymnast Sean Johnson wrote, and it was kind of a rhymey, cute, but like, I'm a champion. And I don't, how, many, how many of you guys have read it? Anyone read it? Yeah, it was popular when she was popular. But I thought, you know, Google in um, poems by athletes. So I came, I came across this Sean Johnson poem, and I thought, I bet if every single athlete in this room writes a poem and we dissect it line by line, that we will come up with similar poems. I did not know it was going to be as eerily cool as it was, but we had this stage and it was sort of dark with these amazing lights and each one of the skaters read a line exactly the way you did. And literally, I got goosebumps. It was the most beautiful, most amazing moment for kids to realize that you know, they're standing next to a national champion. That national champion still has a heart that's pounding out of his chest. Or, you know, that intermediate medalist still has knees that are shaking. So what is the difference? And I like this exercise because it really, it really speaks to the only difference is what you do with those emotions. How you channel those feelings. How well you manage what's happening in your mind. So... What do we do about it, right? Um, what we do about it is we train. We start by creating a mantra. Does anybody have a mantra? No mantras. Well, this is interesting, so let's do this next. You have a mantra. What is your mantra? I can. I have. I will. Awesome. I am strong and confident. I am strong and confident. Good. So the, the rules of a mantra are that it has to be true. And whether it's true in the moment, or whether it's going to be true, or whether you're going to make it be true. Um, my perfect example of that is that Muhammad Ali used to introduce himself as the world's greatest before he was world's greatest. Hi, I'm Muhammad Ali, the world's greatest. We haven't won a world championship yet, but it doesn't matter because right, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You are going to be the world's greatest, so you may as well tell people. So it's true, even if it's just in your mind. It's positive. It's short and to the point. So both of those, both of those mantras were good. If you listen to um, Brian Boitano talk about his gold medal, um, his gold medal competition, whatever he, um, I don't know how you want to word this, but his free skate program, he'll say, I could tell you, if you stop, pause that program at any point 
I can tell you exactly what I was thinking. That's how many years ago? Why can he tell us exactly what he was thinking? He was present, but he choreographed his thoughts. He choreographed every single thought so that it was planned, so that there would be no room for distraction, so that there would be no space for anything negative to creep in. So he knew that if he planned his thoughts the way he calculated his technique, that he would be able to connect mentally and physically that performance. So that's diligence. That's tough. We have a lot of things going on in our lives. We can't always plan all of our thoughts. But what we can do is fill up the static or the negative um, chatter with the mantra. So one of my favorite stories is um, of Jason's mantra. I coach Jason Brown. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he's kind of a good skater, sort of. Um, anyway, uh, so when he was about, he was, when he was going to be a juvenile, so he was about 10, and we had been talking about mantras and taps, and he came up with confidence beats fear. So he kept saying this over and over and over, because I had um, come across some research saying that you have to carve a new neurological pathway in your mind for that mantra to get through the negative chatter. And by saying something 10,000 times, you're going to start to carve that new channel in. Um, it's like opening up a receptor. It's like telling yourself there's new information that needs to um, supersede all the old information. So confidence beats fear is what he would say because um, you may or may not have read about Jason and his competitive anxieties as a youngster, but he would cry, he would pace, he would throw up, he would leave, he would, I had to trick him into competing when he was little, like literally, oh, we're just going <coughs> to sign up for it, but you know what, we won't show up, don't worry about it, we're just going to know that it's there in case you want, I mean, for a long time, so <laughs> I had to trick him off. yeah, because I mean, he just didn't want to do it, so, so anyway, Confidence Beast Fear was the sponsor that he had come up with, and, um, he was going to do the double axle for the first time at Junior Nationals. And he had said confidence beats fear over and over and over. So about a month before Junior Nationals, I said, you know what? It's way beyond confidence at this point. It's preparation. So how would you feel if we changed that first word to preparation beats fear? Because preparation is even more powerful than confidence. Because preparation, you have data for. We've written it down. You can see it in your notebook. It's tangible. And confidence is sort of this intangible thing that's floating out there in space that you may or may not believe you have based on the day or your mood or what you ate the night before, right? <laughs> so about a month before, I started preparing him for the idea that preparation beats fear might be more powerful. And he wanted to think about it, so he like slept on it and came back the next day and he's like, I really like that. And this is a 10-year-old kid. I really like that. I think that's going to work for me. I'm going to go ahead and change it to Preparation Beats Fear. And he changed it, and he won ju Juvenile Nationals that year. And he uh, came off the ice, and he said, thank goodness preparation was the word I used, because I wasn't feeling confident. So I thought, awesome. You have to be flexible in your mantra, and you have to be able to think in the moment. Think about what's, what the most important thing is. I also started to doubt the word confidence because you as an athlete may not be confident when you go out there. You may not feel like you've done what you need to do. So you need to come up with some other means by which you're going to find your competitive fire. So I'd like you to write down a mantra before we continue with, write down a mantra, yeah. Positive, present, true, short and to the point. I don't like the I will be a champion because that's not right here, right now, as I'm entering my double flip. You may not be a champion. I like the, you know, power, fierce. I like words that are just, you can just say them, you can believe them, you can feel them. They take the place of anything that might have to do with your technique. Don't really want you thinking about where your shoulder is supposed to be going into your double flip by that point. It's not there, it's not there, it's probably not going to be there, so don't worry about it. So as a coach, is this, is this you for your coach, or is this you your coach for your student? I think as a coach, I would say 
come up with, you know, mantras for each of your athletes. Right now, come up with what you think would be appropriate for them. <coughs> because, again, I feel as a coach that it's our job to meet them where they are. And so the better we know our athletes, the more we can meet them where they are. Not everybody, you know, not every athlete is going to react the same to different words. So I would write one for each of my skaters. Then have them write one and see if you guys come up with similar terminology. Do we have some mantras? Do we want to share our mantras really quickly? Anybody? Yeah. I will do this. I will do this. How about I do this? Because will means it's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. But I do this means it's happening right now. I'm like, yeah, I can do this. Not I can. I will. No. I do this. I do. I do this. In this moment, I do this. Because if you will yourself to do it, then you're saying, oh, I hope it's ha you know, I hope it happens. Mm -hmm. I'm still giving myself room for it not to happen if I say I will. I don't want to give myself any room. I want to say, I do this. Power and strength. I want to use all of my best attributes to convince myself without having to convince myself that I've got this. Any, any others? Yeah. I define my goals. I'm responsible for my joy. I love that. Now let's shorten it so that when you're on the ice, you don't have to go through all that. So I can't text and No, you can't. You can't. Because look, listen, if you say, I define, okay. does it matter what you're defining? No. Right. You're defining. You're defining you. You're defining your, your package on the ice. You're defining your, and you're defining everything about yourself. So I define, and then what was the second part? I'm responsible for my joy. I define my joy. My joy. My joy. That's it. I love it. Okay. And through every moment of that program while you're on the ice skating, you're defining your joy. That's amazing. Okay. I don't feel ready, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that positive? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I don't know, I've been saying it the last year or so, but just because, like, you're jittery, you're jittery. Yeah. So I don't feel ready, but letting myself, okay, this is a normal feeling. And it is normal. And then it allows me to relax and stop thinking the perfectionist in me. Okay, so, okay, so you're almost giving yourself an opportunity to not be okay. Mm -hmm. Can we come up with a way for you not to let yourself off the hook? Let's talk about this for a second. This is huge. <laughs> this is huge. Okay, I have realized there's this thing where people are afraid to be vulnerable. They're afraid to say, I've busted my <laughs> for six months getting ready for this. It's like you play it off. Sorry, camera, if you're on. I'm just <laughs> um, you're, we're all adults, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I would not say that. I would think of a group of young athletes just saying so you know. that. Um, but you're afraid to say that. So instead of saying that, you say, well, you know, I just want to on. Come on. If you put it all in, say you've put it all in. One of the most powerful things is admitting your vulnerabilities. Because if you admit that you're vulnerable, then you've accepted the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that all of that effort doesn't pay off. But at least you've accepted it. So looking at your fears in their face and saying, the very worst thing that could happen right now is something I'm willing to accept. Doing that is so empowering. If you play it off, or if you don't put your 100% into every single training day, you're giving yourself an out. You're giving yourself room to not be vulnerable, which means you're giving yourself room to not be successful. You cannot give yourself space. You can't. You give yourself that space and you will never achieve your potential. You might achieve your goals, but that's not your potential. Right? Goals and potential are not the same thing. So give yourself an opportunity to feel what it's like to publicly say, I'm vulnerable. Yes, I have worked as hard as I could possibly work. Yes, I have sacrificed. Yes, I have put everything into what I'm doing. And if that's the truth, admit that that's the truth. And feel that vulnerability, because that is a scarier feeling than stepping out on the ice to do what you've trained yourself to do. 
And if you can make that a scarier feeling, then the stepping out on the ice is just stepping out of the ice and going through the motions of what you've already done. Does that make sense? Doing that, I think is, is, I can tell you it's very positive because I've experienced athletes who have accepted that. Um, one of my favorite moments was with Jordan Moeller. I don't know if you've heard of Jordan Moeller, but he's intermediate silver medalist. Yeah, yeah okay. Mike Love. Oh, perfect. Okay, so he's also one of my skaters. And um, I don't know. I mean, I think you guys know Jason and Jordan, but anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're just living in our humble little rink and our little bubble, and uh, come visit us if you'd like. Uh, and then you can see these guys train. But anyway, Jordan, um, Jordan and I were at Junior Worlds. And Jordan was the third guy on a three-man team which means the other two guys were supposed to carry it. Jordan was the guy that made it because he was junior silver medalist, and Shitaro Amori and um, Nathan, Nathan, um, yeah, were, uh, Shitaro had been junior world bronze medalist the year before, and Nathan won everything that everybody ever put in front of him by 30 points. So Jordan was the third guy. So we went there with the message, and in hindsight, I'm like, I gotta change this as as a coach. I gotta make make sure that I don't fall into this trap again. But Jordan has a lot of competitive anxiety, so in my mind, the strategy for helping him was, don't worry, you're the third man on a three-man team. You're not supposed to carry it. You're supposed to go there and get your experience, which I thought was going to be an empowering message for him because, yeah, I need world, you know, junior world experience. I need my points. This is sort of about me this year. I don't have to, to um, do it for my country because they're not looking at me for earning the third spot next year. So we went to Junior Worlds, and that was the message. And then bang, bang, before you knew it, Shitaro didn't even make the, the cut for the free program. And so then it became Jordan and Nathan carrying the team and being responsible for that third spot. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> right. So. Overnight, I had to change my message. And I will tell you that I did not sleep very well that night because I was like, oh my gosh, I might have set this kid up for failure. How dare I have sent him in saying, don't worry about it. But in my mind, we've got the returning world bronze medalist and we've got the guy that beat you by 30 points. There's no way you're gonna have to carry it. Shame on me, now I know better. Um, and so overnight, I thought, what can I give him what can I possibly give him that will help him get through this moment? We had to change the message. Now you are responsible for carrying the team. Now you're a huge part of whether we get three spots next year or whether we get our spots at the on the junior and pre-circuit. So, so overnight I was like, I guess what I'm going to do is hold him accountable. I guess the only thing I can possibly do is say, yeah, you didn't have any pressure going to the short program, but You've got pressure now. So now you have to step up. Now you don't have a choice. Now you're put in that little mental conundrum where you can't get out. There's nothing you can do but step up and own it and be the best version of yourself that you can be. Lo and behold, he looked like a ghost on the six minute warm up, like sheet white, eyes like this. And I turned to our team leader and I said, I know all this safe sports stuff. Could you just walk out for a minute because I am going to slap him across his face and I'm going to bring some blood back in his face. And I'm going to get this guy going and she's like, I trust you. <laughs> Plus we're on Bulgarian soil, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but anyway, no, so I... <laughs> Did you actually hit him? Well, what I like to do <laughs> is just sort of say, it's not going to go across your face, but give me your hands. And I do. I kind of, you know, I kind of like had to zap him a little bit because he needed a little bit of a, yeah, he needed to be shocked back into the moment. Anyway, he landed the most stunning triple axel, um, and it was one of the first ones he ever did in competition, and it was a real step up moment. It was like he just came to life. So my point in saying all that was that as a coach, give yourself a timeless message. Give your skater a timeless message that doesn't have anything to do with what you expect to happen. So you have to expect the unexpected and you have to be prepared for what you don't think is going to happen. And as a skater, don't set, your, set yourself up for successes or failures. Don't say to yourself, that's my hard element, so I better focus on that one. But that's my easy element because guess what? 
you're going to screw up the easy element. It always happens. How many people have had that experience? You go out there and you focus so much. Of course you have. You focus so hard on the hard stuff that you forget that the easy stuff shouldn't be taken for granted. So when we're training programs, one of our little secrets is that we treat jumps like choreography. There's no difference between an axle and you know, a series of turns. Right? Your body still has to be accountable for where it has to be, when it has to be there, how it has to be there, the timing of it, it's exactly the same as choreography. So if you can de-emphasize those jumps by saying this jump is just a moment in the program where I have choreographed leaving the ice, big deal, right? It doesn't feel so crazy. It feels like it's a part of it. So one of the things that we do to make sure that that actually comes true comes to life is train those sections of the program. Does everybody here train sections? How do you train sections? Give me an idea of how you train a section. How would you train a section? Well, first you find section. Okay. Uh, point A to point B. Right. And then I guess start out a section and just Okay. Yeah. Each section for me in my seniors, each section has uh, two jumps in one spin. At least two jumps, at least one spin. The footwork sequence is part of the section. It has to be done within the section. Good. That's great to make sure that you cover those bases and they can segue from a jump to a spin and a spin to a jump. Good. Anybody else? Any other? Yeah. We train the element before the element we want to focus on and the element following with all the steps in between. And okay. Great. Yeah. How about what you're feeling during that section? Okay. Good. Train the emotion. Good. Breathing? Yes. Let's train the breathing? Choreograph breathing. Choreograph breathing. Perfect. So what I like to do is, even though a skater will say, you know, this is my first section, I like to change that bracket three times a week. And I like to say, well, that's nice, but now this is your section. So if these were your sections before, now here are your sections. Mm -hmm. So that now we're overlapping different areas of the program. And then I like to start with things that are unusual to start with. So. It's like starting with an and. Instead of starting with you know, a crossover, let's start with what happens after the crossover, or what happens after the exit of the spin. Things that are unusual sections, because at any point in the program, they, they may have to pick up where something didn't work. A trip, right? We're going to choreograph in, in our training, that you tripped over that crossover. So what happens after that crossover? We usually start with the crossover. Boom, 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 and then you go. What happens if that crossover isn't there? And now you have to start without the crossover. So just kind of switch it up in your mind and prepare for all of those things that may happen. Now, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean obsess over the potential for failure. That means prepare yourself for little pitfalls, little stumbles, moments in time where you may not be able to catch your breath, moments in time where you may be distracted. Maybe it's as simple as a distraction, you know? Maybe that something caught your eye and that crossover didn't happen the way it normally happens and so you're not right on the music where you're supposed to be on the music. The other thing that we like to do is consistency. So when we're talking about preparation, consistency is a huge part of preparation. I like things in threes even though I'm totally an even number person. I don't know why, but I like things in threes. I'm going to give you an example. I thought that was a whiteboard. I got really excited for one second because I'm going to draw for you. I have to draw. Um, this is part of what I do. So here's, a, here's one um, game that I created. It's called the five ten rule. So you're going to give yourself three opportunities to do an element. Let's say that's an axle. Okay, three chances. You do it the first time, it's great. The second time is great. The third time is great. You got 100%. Because each of those three was worth 33.3%. Let's say you missed the first one. Oh, man. Now, you've still done three, and now your percentage is what? 66.6%. My favorite game to play with athletes is add another one. The best you can do is going to be what? 75% It's the best you can do because you've already screwed up that guy. You've already lost 25% out of four. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do another one. 
If you do that next one and you're successful and you have 75%, you may go, yes, 60 to 75% in one jump, that's pretty sweet numbers. Every single elite athlete that I've ever done this experiment with has taken the risk. If you take the risk, you're only going to go up by what? 5%. But if you lose it, you're going to go down by what? So you have a chance to go from 75 to 80, or you have a chance to go from 75 down to 60%. And every single elite athlete takes that risk. Takes that risk. So what does that tell you? A risk takers. <laughs> yes. yes. But there's something behind that. There's something behind that that's a message that I want you to, to try to absorb. They what? Believe in themselves. They believe in themselves, yes, and they want to do what? Get better. Redeem themselves. They want to get better. They want that redemption. I've never met an elite athlete that has said, I'm taking the 75%, I'm out of here. <laughs> I can tell you what kind of athletes take the 75%, sit down and say, I'm done with the game. So typically, what are the athletes' other characteristics going to be if they take the 75% and they back away? Give me just like, let's talk about that person. That person that says, I don't want the chance of another 5%. I don't want the risk of losing another 20%. I want to take my 75 and be done. Fearful, Fearful right? Safe. Safe. Comfortable, Comfortable right? So these are the same people that would rather say, oh, I did one, I'm done for the day. I want to leave it on a high note. Same personality. I don't want to screw it up by doing another one. How are you going to screw it up? There's no chance of screwing it up. You're going to learn something from the mistake that you're going to make if it doesn't work. But there are lots and lots of athletes that do that protective bubble thing. They might be great athletes, but they're not mentally strong. And they're not mentally strong because they don't believe that there's enough of a reward to make it worth the risk. Which takes me to my next point. What is the reward? What are we doing? What is the reward? Is the reward the medal around your neck? Is the reward the standing on the podium? Is the reward the moment that people pay on the back and go, oh, you're our champion? Is that the reward? No. What is, what's the reward? Personal growth. What else? Self-satisfaction. Okay, what else? Yeah. Doing your personal best, competing against yourself. Against yourself, okay. And you could skate the skate of your life and be sixth place. And you could skate really poorly and win. So the reward can really have very little to do with what the result is. <coughs> reward result um, should not be on the same continuum. They're mutually exclusive. So if you can look at the reward and the result as two different entities, then I think you can wrap your mind around what you're really in it for. So take all of the results out of your mind for a minute and think about personal rewards. And write down a list of personal rewards that you achieve from a great skate. Can I have some? Okay, confidence. What else? Feel proud. Pride. What else? Joy to be. Joy. Joy. Joy to be. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Joy to be. Just, yeah. just overwhelming. Yep. I. It. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. What else? Accomplished. You feel accomplished. What else? Empowered. Empowered. Good. What about all of the amazing health benefits that you get? going through this process? Oh, wait. Oh, I'm way past that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's really interesting, what's really interesting is that all of this happiness that you're feeling really makes you a healthier person, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yes. So well, mentally. Mentally healthier person. <laughs> yes. We are not talking about acute injuries. <laughs> We're not talking about overuse injuries. We're talking about, I mean, I'm really addressing the, the fact that People, and I use this, um, it's like 10 rules to, to setting and achieving a goal, and it's kind of a foolproof system for setting a goal and being able to achieve it. It has a lot to do with making it realistic, 
um, I sort of talked about it earlier, but making it public, you know, saying that this is what I'm going to do, not hiding behind it, not trying to um, deny that that's where you really have your, you know, your sights set. You guys walked into a competition and said, I intend to win. Have you walked into a competition and said that? <laughs> why not? You can't control yeah, but why, why wouldn't you say that? You don't have to say it to well, other people, but why wouldn't you just say it to yourself? I intend to win. Can I tell you how many times I've, just checking myself in at like the registration desk at a competition, oh hi, I'm here to pick up my coaching credentials, blah, 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 and a mom comes up and she says, this is my daughter, Sally, Sue, uh -huh. and she has had the flu, and it's been rough, and, right? And so she, this mother's already giving an excuse for why the kid isn't going to do her best. Why? Why does the kid doing it? She's got the flu. Well, it's, but it, it's just, what it is, is just to, it's protecting it, right? Yeah. But we do it to ourselves, too. We walk in with that list in the back of our minds of reasons that we can't achieve what we want to ultimately achieve. I walk in the door and I want to win. Is there anybody that doesn't want to win? Okay, let's just put it out there. You want to win. You want to win because otherwise you wouldn't be in a competitive sport. Tell me you don't want to win, please. Is there anyone in here who doesn't want to win? Is there anyone here who would turn down the gold medal if they said you earned this? <laughs> 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 oh, I really didn't want to win. That wasn't the Right, that wasn't I didn't come here to win, so oh, thanks anyway. No, you don't. You want to win deep in your soul, whether you want to admit it or not, whether you think you're ready or not, whether you think you're good enough or not, you want to win. Yeah, there are nice differences between theory and reality. <laughs> but not necessarily. But if you walk in and you say, I want to win, you can't also be saying in that other part of your mind, but I did twist my ankle last week and I wasn't able to train as hard as I wanted to because I worked too many hours and my dog got sick and threw up at night. Like, you can't have a million other reasons that you can't win. You can't have both. In a mind that's there with competitive fire. You can have one or the other. You can want to win, right? And you can have none of those excuses or you can have all of those excuses and say, well, I'm not really here wanting to win. I'm here with a bunch of excuses. So think of all of those self-sabotaging messages. Write them down. Look at them. Accept them. And then scratch them out. Yeah. Do you find the same like with a training session? You get on and you're like, well, I'm not going to Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have a system that I use with my athletes. I carry highlighters with me everywhere I go. And this is like my favorite thing in the world. I'm not a computer person. Thank goodness I have Heather in the back. If you guys could give Heather a round of applause. Um, <laughs> Heather is my computer person because I'm this person. Like, just give me some markers and a piece of paper and I'm good to go. So I've got it wherever my green is. Probably someone stole my green because they don't even have green. Anyway, I'll put a dot on the top of a training log. And that dot will be... You came in with, you know, you're menstruating, not, you know, or you had a test, you stayed up all night, or you have, there's some reason that you have that red flag. And if that reason is legitimate, you start your training session putting it down, saying this is true, but let me see what I can do despite that. If you had sort of a yellow day, I feel good, I'm okay, but, you know, I had a fight with my best friend and so I might be emotionally kind of weird in the beginning, but I'm going to put yellow today because I feel like I could get through this. Or green, I'm good. This is going to be one of my best training days. So we put that down on the top of the paper when we start the day so that it's almost as though we take those built-in excuses, we make them public, we accept them, and then we do what we can do despite them. So it's a good way of seeing it on paper, saying, okay, I admitted it, and then letting go of all of the details of it. I've used those garage sale stickers before, too, you know? Take a sticker off and go, it's a red day. And then when you have the most amazing day of your life, you can go, oh my gosh, it was a red day, but look what I did with it. Look how I channeled it. And that goes back to the difference between competitors that win and competitors that don't win is that you take your red days and you do something with them. You react differently to bad days, to stress, to nerves, to you know, lack of confidence. Um, so I like that dot idea because it takes all of the details out of the feeling or out of the mood or out of the physical issues. 
Um, the other thing that I was going to say about that topic was, oh, did someone have a question? The other thing I was going to say about that, and I kind of talked about it earlier, is I don't really want you to be thinking about where your shoulder is going into a double flip. And this is very similar. I like to kind of coach the, I like to coach the hum. Mm, right? I had an athlete tell me one time, she brought me the video of um, her sectionals performance. And you could see her doing the triple toe. And I was in the background, and she said that my hands were in my pocket. I took my hands out of my pocket, and I went, my hands back in my pocket. And she was like, look, why are you not so excited that I landed the most amazing triple toe? What is wrong with you? Did you see that triple toe? I saw that triple toe. But I coach the hump. Because if I got really excited about that triple toe, then I'd have to get really upset and throw myself on the floor when she didn't land the next double axle, right? <laughs> so, so you can teach that sort of, mm, right? And you can train that hum. And everything is a hum. Then nothing gets too far away from normal. So Brian Orser and I have talked a lot about his theatrics. And he says, well, that's what keeps me normal. That movement is what keeps me normal. I, on the other hand, have been told, um, well, actually, my first senior nationals as a coach, uh, the NBC cameraman came over to me and said, can you give a little more to the camera? About your performance, not the skaters, huh? This was between the six-minute warm-up and my, and my skaters' performance. So the camera was there. And I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I always like to stand next to um, like Frank or somebody that I think is going to just be really zen. <laughs> I don't like to stand next to the new guy on the block because I, like, I can't stand like, you know, the <laughs> away from me. I've had to actually move myself over sometimes. <laughs> That's rubbing off on me. I can't take it. But I know that Frank's just going to stand there in his fedora and be so cool. And I'm like, I need this guy next to me. So anyway, the, the cameraman was like, you got to give a little more. It's like, um, are you asking Frank to give a little more? Because that's rude. So um, <laughs> he's like, yeah, but you know, the camera likes that kind of stuff. And I said, well, that's very nice. The camera likes that, but I'm here to do a job. And I would like for you to go over to Mr. Nix and Frank and ask them to give a little more. And I, I took it a little personally. I thought this is because I'm female or I'm younger. I don't know, but I, it was kind of offensive. Anyway, I said, no, I'm not giving a little more. I'm going to coach the way I coach, and it's going to have a hum to it. And if you don't like my hum, too bad. Um, but the same thing with technical. So if you're skating a program and you're going through all of your mechanical corrections, you're way behind the game. You are so untrained, I don't even know what to tell you. You may as well just leave it at the boards. So a lot of times what I'll have my athletes do is we'll go through you know, a lesson with some technical corrections. And I'll say to them, OK, the next two that you do, I want you to leave everything analytical, everything intellectual here. And I want you to go do it like an athlete. Don't worry about any correction we've talked about. Go out there with your athlete suit on and go do the jump. And they usually make the corrections. So if you've practiced the correction and you know the correction, you've got to let go of the thought of the correction. Because if the thought is there, by the time the, your body processes it, you need to have been doing 10 other things. <laughs> so let go of, my other piece of advice is let go of all of those mechanical thoughts. And if your coach is still giving you corrections when you're skating away to take your pose, <laughs> turn around and tell them to shut the hell up. Because <laughs> you don't have room for that. There's no more space in your brain for that. You need to rely on what you've done over and over and over. And again, if you haven't done it over and over and over, and you haven't played these games with yourself, and you haven't tried to go for the 80%, then you haven't trained hard enough. You haven't prepared yourself the right way. How am I on time? Don't look. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay, just keep going. Stay here. Okay. Um, the, the last thing that I wanted to say is when you're making a correction, when you're training a correction, train a specific correction pinpoint the thing that you're setting your goal to be. Um, 
Is anybody coming to our adult camp? We're going to do this cool thing that's called the cone game. Okay, if not a lot of people are, I'm going to talk about it now, because then you'll get to do it when you come to camp. Um, and has anyone heard me speak about the cone game before? Okay, so I came up with this game also. It's one of those like, aha, uh -huh. I've done like three smart things in my career. The five time rules one, the taps, rolling poetry is one, and then this cone game. Killer, awesome game. Okay, so the cone game goes like this. Let me use cups. These are actually supposed to be orange cones or hockey pucks. Okay, so I'm gonna take you through how we do this because I have no secrets in my coaching and I think that sharing information is so awesome. So, um, who wants to be my skater? I need a volunteer skater. Okay, come on up. Skater, what element are we working on? Um, triple sap. Sure. Okay, we're doing triple sap. Yes. Okay, so skater, um, what do you, what's your name? Carissa. Carissa, nice to meet you. Carissa, okay. So Carissa, these are your three cones. Now the beautiful thing about these three cones is that they represent unlimited attempts or they represent three attempts. Why is that? Because what we're going to do with Carissa, 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 yeah. <laughs> Carissa is going to set an intention. She's going to say, I'm going to go rotate my triple sound. So let's say she's a popper. Okay, you're a popper. I'm sorry, just for now. Okay. You won't be a popper when you leave. Right. <laughs> this is going to rotate her triple sour. So she's going to take this cone off the pile and say, I am going to rotate my triple sour. She's going to move it over. Okay, so I want you to actually physically take it off and say those words. I am going to rotate my triple sour. Okay, good. All right, then she's going to go out and da 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 and she's going to get there and she's going to drive by it. Oh, Carissa, I'm Ooh. sorry. Okay. That's gone. Too bad for you. Okay. <laughs> but if she did it, it would recycle itself back into the attempts pile. Once those three cones are gone, they're gone. That's all you get to do for that session. You can come back and recone yourself on the next session, but you can't get them back on that session. So now you're going to do it again. Go ahead. So right. I'm going to rotate my triple sound. Good. And I make them say it and do the physical act of moving the cone because for me it's setting an intention. I'm setting an intention and I'm going to follow through. Okay, this time she skates out and she rotates. Guys, round of applause. Good job. We put it back on the pile and then we say, okay, but we want to make some progress in this jump. So now we don't want to just rotate it. We want to rotate it and you're allowed to fall, but you have to fall inside your circle. You have to fall over your skating side. Okay, so she's going to fall down, but it has to be inside the circle. So she goes, and she does it. So you're going to say, I'm going to rotate my triple sow, and I'm going to fall inside the circle. I'm going to rotate my triple sow, and I'm going to fall inside the circle. Okay, good. Excellent. She goes and does it, but she falls outside the circle. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a good try. At least you rotated. But you still lost it, because we said specifically the correction was fall inside the circle. Now, we are, we're down to one, but remember this could be a thousand attempts if she continues to make the correction. When we're down to one, I'm going to give her the power to tell me what she can do. I'm not going to do it anymore as the coach. I'm going to let her say, this is what I, I'm capable of doing in order to continue my attempts. So she may go back to saying, I just want to rotate one. doesn't matter what happens, I just want to rotate it. Or she may say, no, I'm pretty confident this time I can fall inside this room. So what do you want to do? Uh, this time I want to rotate the triple sow, I want to fall inside my circle, but then I want to like ice cream scoop and change my mind and land it. Okay, awesome. Ooh, That's nice. a huge intention. So go ahead and say it, do it. I'm going to rotate my triple sow, <laughs> I'm going to fall inside my circle, and then ice cream scoop, change my mind. Awesome. I can't wait to see this. <laughs> so she goes and she does it, and that's great. Wow, oh my gosh, you made such an amazing version. You get it back. Do you want to do the same thing again, or do you want to go forward a little bit or come backward a little bit? Do you want to lose the change my mind part? Or do you just want to tell me that you want to be on one foot, because you were just on one foot, right? Yeah. So you're going to rotate your triple sow, and you're going to be on one foot. That doesn't mean she can't fall. She's going to land on one foot. So I'm giving you an opportunity to be on one foot, which is really what we want. Okay. Okay. But you're allowed to fall if you have to. Okay. So then we kind of negotiate what the next correction is. So we're very specific. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> so yeah. Good job. 
So we're very, very specific in what we're correcting, when we're correcting it, and accountability. So those are some of my training tricks. Um, any questions? I know we just covered a million different things in two seconds, but that was quick. What do you do when you go into a conversation and you're not ready? Great. So you go and you say, I'm not as ready as I'd like to be, but my goal for this competition is realistic. Set that goal. Tell yourself what you know you're capable of doing, and then live up to that expectation. I think it's crazy to say, I know I'm not ready, but I'm going to go nail it, right? I mean, that's kooky. It might happen, but it's setting you up for failure either way. So I think if you just accept where you are, and that could be a myriad of reasons. But say, this is where I am, this is what I hope, this is what I expect, and this is what I'm going to hold myself accountable for. So those three or four things that you hold yourself accountable for are the markers of your success or failure, in my opinion. Pick three things. Don't say, you know, I want the overall best result. Just say, these three things are things that I know I can do despite where I am in my training. Anything else? Okay, well thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you.